Today I'm going to talk about Timothy Leary's eight circuit model of consciousness and how you can use this model as a means of raising your level of awareness and ideally taking tips and principles from it to help raise your own consciousness level. My main advice to everyone is to, we got to learn how to, uh, to use our heads. We got to realize that uh, the nervous system can be used as an instrument to uh, help us understand why we're here, where we're going. I think we've got to change. Uh, we'd like to see uh, the United States move into its third uh, century uh, with the same spirit we had 200 years ago, a spirit of novelty, of uh, there's something uh, great and imaginative and free uh, so that we can have the pride that uh, Americans uh, used to. Okay, so what is the first circuit? The first circuit is referred to as the Ourobio Survival Circuit. I like to rephrase that as Biological Survival Circuit. I think it, it just helps me think about it a little better. And, okay, what is this circuit? How does this circuit or system develop? And the origins are found in our early um, awareness as a being after we've spent nine months in the womb and we've come out into the new world and we are in a very vulnerable stage and looking to um, make some judgments about the world even in our pre-verbal state about what kind of uh, environment that we are in and what we do is we make uh, an assessment that leads into our later life and this primary assessment is uh, uh, approach or avoid meaning is the world safe or is it not safe is the world a place where I can readily get uh, nourishment um, safety from whoever my primary caregiver might be or is this world unreliable is it difficult to obtain the resources that I need in order to survive and this can be um, quite uh, let's see quite dependent on the environment or circumstances that we happen to be in whenever this imprinting stage is happening and it's not to uh, make any sort of uh, harsh judgments towards our parents and what their abilities or capacities were at the time. Uh, a lot of this stuff can be uh, happenstance of just what was going on at that at that time. And what it does is it sets up our nervous system for uh, our foreseeable future unless we are able to uh, reprogram ourselves in a sense of how we will react whenever there is something externally in the environment that we perceive could be a threat. So one example used in the book is to think about uh, you are sitting at home and there's a knock at the door. I will now conduct an experiment. Excellent. Good guard dogs. Go get him. So immediately, without any thought, um, the dog starts barking, right? And this is typically twofold. The dog is alerting you, the pack leader, to the possibility of a potential threat, and it's also alerting the possible threat that that dog is ready to um, attack it if need be. So our nervous systems function similarly based upon this early imprint, and this becomes 
how we interpret the world around us. And uh, think about, let's say, again, you're sitting at home and you hear a car backfire outside. Maybe you don't even know that it was a car, you just hear a bang, right? There's a loud noise outside. And you have, uh, for your own personal survival, split second to determine if that is a potential threat to your survival or not. Um, and just as with the dog, with us, this typically happens automatically. So something talked about, I believe in Alexander Technique, is the startle response. Okay, so a question, uh, maybe a little self-diagnosis would be, how do I know if I have uh, a faulty or negative imprint on this first circuit uh, or this first system of my consciousness? And that would typically manifest itself in someone as uh, a person we would describe as being uptight or someone that's very rigid. So someone with a first system negative imprint will be very uh, chronically constricted uh, internally. So chronic tightening of the muscles, the organs, the viscera, all of those things. And this is something that uh, will typically cause uh, health issues, especially hormonal, um, because of... Uh, the lack of energy flow through the glandular system. Okay, so the first system, the biosurvival, is primarily associated with attachment to a mother figure. Now, interesting uh, observations have shown that when a primary mother figure is not present, that uh, an organism will find the, the nearest substitute during this primary uh, imprinting phase, as they would call it. So one example would be that uh, um, a giraffe was evidenced to have, uh, shortly after birth, its mother was killed, and instead of it following another giraffe, it imprinted a mother figure upon a jeep, and it then tried to uh, follow the jeep around, it tried nursing from the jeep, and when it got to maturity it actually tried to mate with the jeep. Now uh, this is very interesting implications on uh, what this could mean for any organism that has a faulty imprint on a mother figure. Uh, this first system is also uh, related to uh, breastfeeding as primary nourishment for an infant and it has everything to do with our mouths in general. So uh, likely most oral fixation as far as whether you have a smoking addiction, um, overeating, any of those types of things would be related to, uh, uh, I guess, a disrupted first circuit. Now, um, the next point I wanna talk about is that uh, there is ways of, uh, I guess, strengthening the first circuit. And uh, the phrase that comes to mind is uh, to become comfortable being uncomfortable. Now, to strengthen this first circuit, uh, essentially, we are looking to expand our comfort zone. Uh, one traditional way of doing this would be uh, in something like asana yoga where you're holding uh, one pose or position for extended periods of time and what you're doing is you're practicing being in a place that is uncomfortable physically and watching what happens um, inside you. Typically, in my experience, you want to run away from that. Um, whether that's fidgeting, boredom, uh, you start thinking about you know, your to-do list, or um, you just kind of space out, and um, what you want to do to be able to, uh, I guess, grow in, in many endeavors in your life is to step into areas that are uh, 
just beyond your comfort zone and to find a comfortable space within that. Uh, this reminds me of uh, a little graph that I've seen on what they call the flow state. So in flow state, you have, uh, it's it's the Goldilocks spot. It's it's the just, just right, just in the middle. So typically we have, uh, you know, let's say we pick up a new endeavor. We, we want to start rock climbing, whatever it is. You have, uh, you know, you have challenges, right, in any endeavor. And you have challenges that are way beyond you that uh, if you were to do it, you would just get destroyed. It would be so difficult that it would be discouraging. Uh, on the opposite end of that spectrum, you have uh, something that is well beneath your capabilities. So it's so easy that it's boring and you don't uh, even want to engage with it. So what we look for is, to progress at something is to find that, that Goldilocks spot where it's it's not too difficult and it's not too easy, but it's just the right amount of challenge. And that's what we want as far as uh, expanding our comfort zone. So we want to slightly step into areas that are just a bit uncomfortable for us and then progressively as we adapt to uh, that discomfortable area and it then becomes comfortable, we want to keep extending that uh, if we want to reach a certain level in whatever uh, chosen endeavor that that might be. So that is how we expand our first oral bio survival circuit. Okay, so as I'm going through the eight circuit model, uh, I think something to keep in mind is that this is essentially uh, development. Let's see if I can get this to focus. We're talking about the development of the human nervous system and uh, different stages that that we go through. I think in common speech, we typically refer to as certain elements of personality or behavior as being hardwired. And uh, if you follow this type of model, um, you'll see that uh, behavior is not essentially uh, hardwired as far as uh, a, a view of our genetics go. It more becomes patterns that we develop uh, in early childhood and through our adolescence in order to uh, keep us safe and survive later in life so that uh, we don't have to think a lot about it, um, and that would be the case if we had uh, healthy imprints. Um, however, if we do have unhealthy imprints, then we do actually have to invest time and energy into um, quote-unquote rewiring ourselves, even though I don't like that term. Um, so the second uh, nervous system development is and just as an aside this model uh, that Leary created is an extension or built off of uh, Freud's psychosocial uh, model that he developed um, so it it is somewhat in alignment with that that being said the second uh, circuit or system is referred to as the anal emotional territorial circuit and this one is uh, very much uh, involved with authority and um, uh, essentially hierarchy and how uh, we view ourselves in terms of a uh, social group. Um, the first part of the name of the circuit, uh, that being anal, is the time typically from ages around one to three where we are uh, first starting to, um, whether it's potty training or uh, if, if you watch a, a child during these years, they are learning to crawl, uh, later learning to walk. So they're developing neuromuscular control of their body, um, learning 
how to control their bodily functions, whereas the first circuit was pretty much all about input and breastfeeding, um, taking nourishment in. The second circuit is more about uh, excretion and the, uh, the boundaries that come along with that. Um, typically, we have some sort of potty training, whereas when we're infants, we can just uh, kind of go um, as we please then there starts to be rules and boundaries uh, enforced on us where um, we are potty trained and we have to go at a certain time, at a certain place, in a certain area, uh, whatever that might be for each individual. So this is where uh, the first circuit is more associated with the mother. This circuit is more associated with the father and the uh, authority figure. So um, as we're developing our, our physical beings, we have uh, really no inborn programs of how to do certain things. Uh, I, I imagine that learning to crawl is something that is very much a trial and error process for every person alive. Uh, and then once we do start to walk, I think we take certain cues uh, from our parents. Uh, if you observe most children with their parents, typically uh, people will have very similar posture, very similar gait in their walking to um, one of their primary caretakers. And this is very much a, a learned behavior. Okay, so for the second system of our nervous system development, I think one thing to think about is essentially the concept of muscle memory. So these patterns that we develop at this time uh, are our are, are primary way of, of walking for the rest of our life conceivably if we don't uh, later retrain ourselves how to do this or um, if we don't have a basis of uh, physical strength building in our um, adolescence or early childhood such as like gymnastics or martial arts or something like that um, so for many people that don't engage in those types of activities um, what they learn here primarily from their parents is uh, typically what they're going to carry with them for the rest of their life uh, as far as what's been programmed into their nervous system and how they move their physical being throughout the environment uh, from day to day now uh, going back to um, one of the primary features of this stage of development, which is uh, all about politics and hierarchy and where we stand. Uh, we first learn within our own family, uh, the same way that you know animals like chickens have a pecking order, or if you look at a pack of dogs, you have the top dog and the bottom dog. Um, so you have this spectrum of essentially who uh, you can push around or who um, you can manipulate to do other things versus um, who you will be more subordinate or submissive to. Um, so at the extremes you have a tyrant on one end of the spectrum and on the other uh, end of the spectrum something like a slave. If we're looking to strengthen this part of our nervous system, um, one would be developing a physical practice where we learn greater control over our bodies and our nervous system. Um, I think building more adaptability to uh, make judgments and better discernment about situations that we may be in in life as far as whether or not um, it's safe uh, with certain people um, or situations or within a society, all these types of things. And uh, another part would be to, um, it would be to decrease uh, or become aware of things that trigger a fight or flight response and um, be able to lessen those to a certain degree, uh, especially for people that have chronic anxiety or depression or something like that, to find ways of uh, identifying and um, building more resilience to the things that trigger them uh, in their daily life. The third circuit or system in Timothy Leary's eight circuit model and this one is called the time binding circuit and this one 
the key quote that stands out to me when I think about this one is that uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So I think uh, the term time binding was coined by Alfred Korzybski and it means something like that uh, because of uh, written language and um, recorded history, we are able to accumulate knowledge over time um, passed down through generations. Uh, and this is incredibly useful for us and it's something that many people have noted has been accelerating uh, throughout the course of time since we did start recording things. So the doubling of knowledge and information uh, tends to happen faster and faster as you accumulate it um, by exponential terms and mathematical factors. So, whereas the first circuits, um, one and two, uh, we could look at this from the model of the triune brain. So, uh, if you've ever heard the concept that we have three types of brains, the first system would be the reptilian brain, the older, more prehistoric one. The second would be the mammalian brain, which would be more like our uh, chimpanzee ancestors. And the newest one, the, the frontal cortex, would be our more human brain. Um, which would be the newest one that has come online. And uh, something that Jordan Peterson noted was that because it's the newest, it's the one that we actually have the least amount of control over. So uh, with that in mind, it is very uh, easy for our thinking mind, our human mind, to be hijacked or uh, our nervous system to essentially take over the functions of our total being um, and rule out any sort of rational or logical thoughts that we might have or act upon. Uh, one example that uh, Uncle Bob told was think about when you go to the movie theater and you go to see a horror movie, right? So you're sitting in your chair and uh, it's the scene where, you know, um, you can feel the presence of the villain or whoever coming and, you know, the music's, um, you know, dark and ramping up and then, you know, you finally see the killer's face or whatever it is. Um, and even though you're in a chair, you know that you're eating popcorn and you're sitting inside a theater and that you're just looking at a screen that has images projected on it. Um, despite knowing all that with your rational mind, you still may jump in your chair. And that shows that you don't really have uh, full control over your nervous system. Uh, like we talked about in the prior, previous videos, those things are much older systems in your body and they're there for a reason to protect you for survival purposes and uh, just being aware of that I think is incredibly important to know um, that uh, if you look at the political landscape or just how people behave in society in general that uh, you know a lot of times we might say well, why do people do certain things like isn't it common sense to not do that Yes, it, it might be from a rational cognitive uh, standpoint, yet things still happen because people are so easily hijacked by their nervous system. Um, so that's where uh, an element of, of growth can be in a human being is to uh, lessen the ability of your own nervous system to um, hijack you, essentially. I'm saying the word hijack a lot. Okay, so problems we get into with the uh, third circuit would be um, essentially, I think one of the biggest problems facing humanity is just the idea of mistaking the symbol of what something is for what the quote unquote reality of it actually is. And as a species, we are seriously in danger of being completely fooled by our own thinking processes. I can give some very simple illustrations of this. One of the main, main symbols which all civilized people use is money. It's a very convenient symbolism because it gets rid of the necessity for barter, of having to go down to the store with a truckload of eggs in order to buy some clothes. So we use money instead. And when you go to the supermarket, 
and you roll up to the cashier a great cart full of goodies. And the girl goes, tickety 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 and this long tape comes out. And she says, $30, please. Most housewives feel slightly depressed <coughs> at parting with $30. Whereas they've got the real wealth in the cart. That's what you got. You got rid of some paper. But you've got edible goodies in the cart. Something's wrong with you. And uh, we are witnessing right now a major crisis economically <coughs> because of a stupid thing called gold, which has some use for filling teeth and making jewelry. <coughs> but when hoarded in vast vaults and fortresses, it is completely useless doing nothing. But the superstition, you see, that gold is wealth, or that money is wealth, is the confusion of the symbol with the reality. So a couple of sayings uh, in regards to this are, uh, the map is not the territory, um, meaning that if you have a physical map of an area, it's just a representation of that area. It's not the area itself, quite obviously. Um, or the one I really like is the meal is not the menu. And what that means is like, uh, the example that Bob gave is that you go to a restaurant and you look at the menu and you decide, okay, I want the cheeseburger, whatever it is. And you then formulate a, a mental image, a symbol of what that cheeseburger is or is going to be. Uh, so you are already like projected into the future and when them whenever the food comes out uh, your experience then uh, the emotions that you feel um, can be completely predetermined by that mental image or sensation idea that you had already previously formulated so let's say that um, uh, let's say you, you take a bite and that is the best burger you've ever had, right? It, it far outseated your expectations. Um, and then on the flip side, let's say, uh, you had a burger last week and this one, for whatever reason, doesn't taste as good. So this one, um, your experiences, maybe you're, you're bummed out or you're disappointed, whatever. Um, purely based on that preconceived uh, idea of what you had in mind of what that burger was going to be. Now what's important here is noting that it really is only the actual experience of eating it that, that matters. Um, if you're able to uh, tap into the present moment and just be with that without uh, preconceived notions um, you might have a very different experience of it um, it's a very difficult thing to do um, and I don't even know that it, it's always beneficial to do that um, but it's an idea So one, one beautiful part of this third circuit or system that, that Bob talks about is this concept of reality tunnels, which I think is a really fun thing to just play with. And uh, he mentioned uh, there would be like an experiment where you would have a classroom and the professor would tell everybody to go out into the hallway and then everybody comes back in and he would have them all describe what they saw in the hallway. And what they find is that everybody describes it completely different, like people see different things. So that example shows that everyone has their own, uh, their own perception of reality. So everything is in a sense relative um, to the lens that each of us uh, filters information from the external environment um, to ourselves. And this is, uh, I think, largely, um, yeah, a, a huge part of it is cultural, um, you know, uh, filtered by the very language that we speak, which determines what our thoughts are. Um, it's 
determined by the technology that we have and use every day. Um, all the things that have been passed down to us uh, by the collective of our culture and humanity at large uh, largely play a role on each of our own uh, unique individual uh, models or tunnels of reality. Yeah. Uh, one, one final thought that I have about this circuit is, uh, in general, it, to me, a large part of it would be um, understanding duality uh, and recognizing that uh, Duality gives things meaning in a sense uh, You can listen to plenty of Alan Watts talk about this uh, Things like we wouldn't know up without down. We wouldn't know hot without cold. So it's it's by knowing an opposite that uh, We can make sense of and, and understand uh, duality in in nature and um, within ourselves as well Okay, so now that we've wrapped up the first three systems uh, one thing I did want to note that I could likely do a full separate video on is something that fits into this model which is called transactional analysis and that looks at different ego states of human beings. Okay, next up is circuit number four. This is the sexual circuit. And this is when puberty or adolescence uh, reaches maturity and we start to develop uh, sexual drive. The front left neocortex uh, connects with the genital area and we start going through the different body and mind adaptations that occur during puberty. Uh, one thought I had about this circuit is that um, faulty imprinting can be, I think, common on this one. I'm, I'm sure it's probably common on all of them actually. Um, Faulty imprinting on this uh, circuit in particular would be because for a lot of people their first sexual experiences are not of their own volition or choosing, um, especially in cases of rape and incest and those types of things, um, or just generally confusion, uh, exploration, uh, especially um, the taboo against like male on male sexual exploration. Uh, these types of early uh, explorations with members of either the same or opposite gender um, create uh, what could be lifelong guilt or shame based around sexual preferences. Uh, this circuit, um, let's see, there's a lot of, uh, well every culture has their own um, acceptable uh, practices surrounding sexuality and uh, most cultures are trying to have their young people fit into what that model is and like I stated previously because of all of the external factors that can uh, occur during this age uh, I think of um, even now in today's age where uh, young Adolescents might be exposed to pornography of all different uh, types. This can lead to imprinting, and this is where things like fetishes and uh, things that um, each individual considers to be like turn ons or turn offs develop uh, during this stage of imprinting. So, breaking through this fourth circuit typically in, in many traditions uh, included a vow of celibacy uh, so essentially not divesting energy and resources towards the pursuit of sexuality uh, rather um, investing those more heavily in the arts or creativity or uh, thought experiments those types of things um, another point referenced in the book was that this is why many uh, homosexuals are um, either artists or um, like shamans or mystics or that type of thing is because when you devote uh, much of your resources to child rearing and um, developing the next generation you don't have as much time space energy to devote that towards 
uh, I guess essentially smashing through like current paradigms and coming up with uh, new ways of being and, and modeling culture in that way. Uh, I think of figures like Da Vinci or Freddie Mercury, Elton John, those types of guys that um, had a huge uh, cultural impact um, in those types of ways. Okay, so one thing to note as far as re-imprinting for the first four circuits, I'm going to go through each one and talk about uh, essentially different Eastern practices mostly that are associated with them as far as expanding and, and re-imprinting the nervous system. So the first one is for uh, the sensation circuit, which is the, uh, the bio-survival. Uh, the first yogic practice for that is asana, and the goal there is to um, <clears throat> hold postures for long periods of time, like I mentioned earlier, to become comfortable being uncomfortable. The second for the emotional territorial is uh, pranayama, which is uh, heavily focused on calming the emotional center. Uh, I would say like non-reactivity or um, just general emotional intelligence is what helps expand the second uh, system of the nervous system. And the third is for the, um, what's the third called? Oh, so the semantic time binding circuit, uh, the third system is to practice a mantra, um, which is with the goal of uh, removing thought or words from the head. So uh, essentially repeating something over and over again, um, whether verbally or in thought, so much to the point where it becomes meaningless and thoughts can cease at that point. And then for the fourth socio-sexual circuit is, as I mentioned, um, the extremes of either practicing uh, Tantra or um, celibacy as a practice to uh, be more, I guess, um, let's see, uh, celibacy or Tantra to um, not have energy lost towards the act of uh, reproduction or lovemaking or devoting towards a family. So in order to break through to the higher circuits, um, one has to have enough energy available to do so um, without devoting it or depleting it through the act of sex. Um, so that is uh, the different practices for expanding the first four circuits. Uh, next we will move on to circuit number five. Okay, moving right along, we are on to circuit number five. And Circuit number five is, in a sense, a higher level of circuit number one, which if you recall is the oral, oral, oral bio survival circuit, which is pure dependency on the mother for survival. Circuit number five is, in a sense, bio So this is whenever a person is basically you know, post-adolescence and they are re-infantized. Uh, they are taken back to a place of helplessness where they're completely dependent upon somebody else for their survival needs. Uh, so some of the things that Bob mentions in this chapter is um, uh, simultaneously re-imprinting, uh, especially a lot of the uh, most recent neuroscience that's come out, I'm filming this in 2019, so even back in 2012, I think I read The Brain That Changes Itself, or uh, yeah, those types of books on neuroplasticity in general. Um, so simultaneously, we have the greatest potential or hope for human beings to get out of our robotic patterns um, that in, in most senses were accidentally or um, uh, yeah, mostly accidentally imprinted on us when we were children. Um, so we have great hope for people to be able to change themselves to improve 
uh, to build higher levels of compassion, care, empathy, uh, all these types of things. And on the other hand, um, we see the shadow side of that. So people looking to use these methods of re-imprinting to control others. So that's kind of the dichotomy that we face is like, it's like anything that's a tool that you can use. Like you can take a hammer and you can build a house with it or you could beat somebody over the head with it. So this re-imprinting is the same thing. It's incredibly powerful for someone to um, heal themselves in essence and it's also incredibly dangerous whenever uh, someone else might use these means to uh, have somebody else do what they want. Um, we saw this a lot with like uh, Charles Manson and any kind of cult that could potentially um, brainwash people to drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak. So these types of things are a huge concern. One final piece about brainwashing is that um, when when this is done through nefarious means or with ill intent behind it, um, typically uh, the the people that are doing the brainwashing are uh, preaching to their converted that they, in essence, um, have the magic key or antidote or the golden ticket for them to experience these states and without them as their leader that these people won't be able to reach them. Um, which I think this book goes to disprove that um, anyone can access these on their own uh, without following some sort of guru or cult leader or whatever. I think one thing that, that Bob noted in this chapter is once you break through the fourth circuit, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm assuming this is what he's talking about here, is that you start experiencing uh, a lot of synchronization in your life, um, meaning something seemingly improbable or like chance happenings become more and more frequent. And this is something that Jung uh, actually wrote a book about that I have on my shelf back there and um, the Jungians he, he claims um, that when these synchronicities are happening it's a sign of uh, deep messages coming from the collective mind or the collective unconscious that type of thing um, and and it seems like post signs that are usually pointing someone in the right direction I think my take on it um, since I've started going down this road, uh, I've definitely experienced a lot of these things personally, um, mass synchronicities in my life, and uh, it, it, it's kind of like, you'll hear people talk about if you, let, let's let say, uh, let's just take like Tesla cars for example, like if you never knew that Teslas existed, um, once you find out that they do, you'll likely start seeing them everywhere. So there's this effect where once uh, something is put on your, your kind of mental map, um, you're more primed to being able to pick it out of the environment. And I think it's pretty self-evident why that would be is, um, let's say you're in a tribe and you found uh, uh, a new edible plant and uh, yeah, this was like a revelation, like it's delicious and, and it's uh, it's it's something that while you're walking through your environment, you're going to be more primed to looking for and seeing it. So yeah, some of the other things Bob talks about in this chapter is uh, the anti-aging movement. And I think this book was written, I want to say in the 80s or 90s. Um, but even then, um, people talking about life extension, the, the chance that... Uh, technology could increase to the point where like I would never die um, if I wanted to. Now I've listened to Alan Watts and I don't know if that's the best idea. Uh, in in his estimation, and, and I think I agree with this, is that uh, when, when you die you essentially give space or you give another being uh, the chance at their turn to, to exist. Um, it would be interesting though to live for a very long period of time and see how many skills or things that you could master in in a single lifetime um but now with like people like dave asprey and ray kurzweil and all these other people that are looking at 
anti-aging and uh, potential life extension and moving consciousness into uh, robots or whatever it is. Um, it's gonna make for a very interesting, weird future, I believe. Yeah, and he talks about um, a culturization and there's a saying uh, from the Jesu Jesuits, I believe. It's something like, give me a child until he's five and I'll show you the man. And what that means is uh, if if I'm able to heavily affect the imprints on the first three or four circuits, then um, I can, I can, with reasonable assurance, show you what kind of person he's going to be, he or she is going to be when they're older. And I think this is why most people uh, end up becoming pretty similar to their parents in a lot of respects is because those early imprints are set in place and if they've never done any sort of um, the exercises that I've listed previously to uh, expand each of those circuits, then they're likely going to uh, lead very similar lives to their parents uh, in a lot of respects. So that is the fifth circuit. I think at a later point I will talk more about um, how to expand that circuit. Uh, one of the things he mentioned is the use of uh, psychedelic drugs. Other techniques of activating the system would be prana, pranayama, so breathing techniques. Uh, other things would be like isolation tanks can activate this fifth neural circuit, um, zero gravity chambers, and then the use of cannabis is another one. Uh, and what this typically does is it heightens the sentences of the body and uh, uh, helps achieve like states of bliss and overall like sensual feelings. Um, so in general, like sounds become more clear, things taste better, uh, uh, emit, like um, vision gets sharper, like better depth perception, uh, visual acuity. Um, what's it called, like, line detection, edge detection, in sight. So, uh, when the fifth circuit is activated um, just as easily as uh, the senses to be heightened in a pleasurable way, it's also quite possible for the senses to be acted um, in an unpleasurable way. Whereas this is when people, if they smoke cannabis, they become extremely paranoid um, or incredibly frightened or scared, those types of things. Uh, all the senses coming in, it, it, it can be like sensory overload and it's a debilitating or painful uh, experience as opposed to a, a blissful experience. Typical signs of people that have entered the fifth circuit are they don't get sick very often. Uh, they have a glow to them and they have what you would call like a bounce in their step. They just have a lot of vibrance in their biological being. Um, yeah, a couple historical notes that Bob mentioned are um, typically in the past whenever people would break into the circuit uh, because of uh, religious or cultural taboos, they would quickly be squashed or put back in place. Um, for being overly joyous <laughs> as a thing. Um, and I, that usually triggers people that are in the lower circuits. And going into the fifth circuit typically removes problems from the first four circuits. Uh, the fourth one, it typically removes guilt from there. Uh, it removes confusion from the third circuit. It, um, you, you look at like either bullying or cowardice from the second circuit and they both seem kind of ridiculous and the first circuit uh, physical ailments and symptoms uh, tend to go away um, uh, one one anecdote that he shared was that just as misery loves company uh, people that have entered the fifth circuit and they enjoy blissful experiences those people also um, when they see this they want other people to feel as pleasurable as they do and I think people can get into trouble when this happens because they'll start uh, preaching or trying to convert others to getting to this state and that usually um, does the opposite so people it actually kind of pushes them away when they try to um, have them enter this more blissful state of being. In general one thing I thought that was interesting about this is that 
Uh, all of these states, I think, it, it's safe to say that they're in in constant flux, um, and n no state of being is in any sense per in, in any sort of permanence. Um, possibly the eighth circuit. I'm not quite sure about that. I don't think I'm there. Uh, but for these ones, like physical ailments, one thing they mentioned was uh, Frederick Nietzsche, he had um, what looked like essentially a pharmacy in his closet uh, for his various physical ailments. Um, probably what a lot of modern like health nut people look like as far as taking supplements and that kind of thing goes. Uh, so whenever you experience, in, in my personal um, opinion, like higher states of well-being, uh, it, it becomes addicting in a sense and uh, you keep wanting to go back to that and then like when I have physical ailments I want to um, find solutions or uh, ways of getting rid of them as, as soon and quickly as possible. Um, so that's something that happens in the fifth circuit. Okay, moving on to the sixth circuit. This one is referred to as the metaprogramming circuit. Uh, one of the big pieces that stands out in this one is the ability to metaprogram oneself, uh, which is referred to in alchemy as the great work. And that is basically to take negative energy and turn it into positive or to dissolve or disperse that negative energy. To me, it's like it's you, you have higher levels of compassion, so you can understand that if someone's throwing shade at you, that that person is likely in pain or hurting um, and is uh, they're, they're on the other end of the spectrum of misery loves company so they're trying to bring you down um, so being able to to notice that recognize it be non-reactive towards it and to uh, yeah not continue to pass on that sort of energy um, so finding ways of of uh, dissolving it. The Sixth Circuit is related with uh, Jung's idea of the collective unconscious and, and tapping into that. Uh, and Bob talks a lot about uh, the realization that um, there's something that's inside you that is also inside everybody else and since it's inside everybody else that means it's also outside of you. So it's inside of you and outside of you at the same time. Um, and that's what you would call like the collective unconscious. They talked about at the Galapagos Islands, there were birds that um, would crouch whenever they flew over a kite that was shaped like a hawk. Uh, where on that island, to their knowledge, a predatory birds like hawks hadn't been there in a very long time, and yet it was still encoded in these birds that that symbol or shape in the air meant um, danger or predator. Um, so they use that as an example of collective unconscious. Um, so it's like, it's like information is everywhere and, um, they talk about it being like non-local. So each one of us would be like a piece of hardware or like an antenna and the software or the information is, it's all around us. Like we're in a sea of it. And it's only a matter of um, tuning ourselves in to the ability to being able to receive it. Um, let's see. Um, also associated with the Sixth Circuit is uh, Transcendence of Time. And uh, I think a, a book that I read was called The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. and. The kind of premise of that book is that we are essentially vehicles for our DNA to be passed on from one generation to an, the next. So from our genetic standpoint, um, we are temporary and the, the genes themselves are the more type of um, immortal beings or the ones that at least uh, live live longer um, in, in the history of time. So. Uh, I think just recognizing that you, you kind of understand uh, that, at least in my experience, that that I'm a living being and that, um, let's see how to explain this. Yeah, it's the idea that like nothing, nothing stops, 
like matter isn't created or destroyed, it just transforms into different things. Um, they talked in this circuit a lot about uh, just the general idea of optimism and how optimism shapes reality. Um, and they use an example of a man named Norman Thomas who overcame tuberculosis and um, he was noted to have like a rare African disease that was incurable and, uh, and cured himself of it. So like faith healing and that type of thing is associated with the circuit and being able to, as it's called, metaprogram yourself to um, create reality. Another association with the sixth circuit is um, They kind of term it like access to DNA uh, memory. Um, I've never experienced this personally. Uh, it's people who have uh, past life memories or um, there's a, a term in theosophy called the Akashic Records where um, according to them they can look back through past lives and see what their karma might be. Um, I don't have any direct experience with that, so I can't speak on it um, intelligently. And then it is also associated with, um, so that's past lives, it's also associated with uh, visions of the future and prophecy and that type of thing. And then I think I think I mentioned uh, synchronicity as part of the fifth circuit. Um, it might be. It sounds like, uh, as I read further, that it's even more associated with the sixth circuit. So synchronistic events happening, and they used an analogy of it's something like uh, it it being the sixth circuit being um, housed in your front right neocortex. And it's like that is like the magnet or the attractor to certain mm -hmm. situations. And then your left brain will rationalize it as um, being like mere coincidence uh, as it's unable to explain that the right hemisphere was what uh, drew you to being in that certain right place at the right time for that synchronistic event to happen. As an exercise, it was like, asking yourself like what when when those things happen so you have uh like a what you would consider a synchronicity what what in that instance is your right brain trying to tell you and and it feels something like intuition so it's uh why why are you being drawn to that situation or scenario and um what is there in it for you so in the seventh circuit we have uh, essentially access to all of the preceding circuits, so one through six, um, become accessible to us. Was it blurry? Focus on me. There we go. Um, so, in essence, uh, the analogy is made that we are the universe looking at itself. So, simultaneously, the universe is creating us and we are also creating the universe as in what we know the universe to be is described in terms of how we perceive it through our sensory apparatus apparati <laughs> um, so with the seventh circuit uh, I think that one thing that came to mind was the example of Wim Hof, who is someone who is not, uh, let's see, he's not s subject to his environmental circumstances in the ordinary sense. I think a point to be made is in the Seventh Circuit we are um, in the seventh circuit, we have the realization that environmentally, uh, we can be triggered into different states of being from all the previous circuits. So if we are in a life uh, or death situation, we may be triggered into 
first circuit awareness. If we are sexually attracted to someone, we may be triggered into fourth circuit awareness. So there is no uh, eighth day of the week, obviously. Yeah, and in the Hindu system, the uh, eighth chakra is not in the body, but above the body. Yeah, I call that the non-local quantum circuit. Leary kept changing his name for it. I forget why. I think the last his last book he called it the non-local, the non-local uh, atomic circuit or something like. That. He was getting closer to my label. We were influencing each other for uh, several years there. I call it the non-local quantum circuit because uh, one of the most fascinating things in quantum mechanics is Bell's theorem, which has been confirmed five times now. And it's not only mathematically sound, but experimentally it's been verified. And uh, what Bell's theorem says basically is that everything in the universe is in harmony with everything else in the universe. Well, more specifically, it says any two particles once in contact continue to remain correlated in mathematically precise ways, no matter how far apart from each other they move. Even if they're so far apart that information from one can't get to the other in the time you're taking your measurements. So how does information get around faster than light if the things are that far apart? Well, nobody knows, but uh, David Bohm, for instance, gave three uh, lines of interpretation. One is that we're going to have to radically redefine our ideas of both space and time, even more radically than Einstein did. The second is that information somehow travels faster than light, even though energy can't. How can information travel without energy? Well, that's the mystery to be solved, but information is somehow getting around. And the third approach is that it's not traveling around, it's always there. The hardware is local. And this is where I like to quote Jack Sarfati, a physicist who I don't get along with very well, but he does have some great metaphors. And his metaphor for this mysterious interconnectedness, of which Douglas Adams, remember, said everything is interconnected, but some things are more interconnected than others. Jack Sarfati's model is think of the universe as an enormous computer. Then think of our galaxy as a smaller computer within the bigger one, our planet a smaller one within the galaxy, our body is a smaller one, our brain is a smaller one, the cells of the brains are even smaller. You work your way down to the quark level, and you've got this mini, 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 mini computers. Below the quark level, presumably, there are even smaller computers. And, and in all cases, the hardware is localized. The hardware is here, not there, now, not then. I mean, from wherever you are, is here and now. So the hardware is always localized, but the software is everywhere at once. It's outside space-time entirely. And this is what comes up in uh, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, high doses of LSD, almost any dose of ketamine and profound practice of yoga over a number of years. It's called Samadhi, union with everything. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. There's so much more that I wanted to say in this video, and it took me a long time to edit and film this. So I appreciate if you were able to make it this far. It's really long, and I hope you got something out of it that can help you. And I can hope to continue making videos like this in the future. If you could please like and subscribe, that would help me out a lot so I can continue making content like this. I uh, also have a Patreon page. Any donations there would be greatly appreciated. Thanks again, and I hope to see you soon.